Is there one witness in here? Yes, God. Father, we are witnesses today and we are here to declare that Jesus Christ is Lord and King of Kings. And so, God, we thank you for all that you do in our lives and we thank you that you even allow us to do and to serve and to even be your people. We are grateful, eternally grateful. And so, God, we just pray now, God, that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be found acceptable in your sight. Oh, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say amen. amen. Come on, give him one more hand clap of praise this morning, thanking him. Woo. And let me just pray a prayer over the offering. Father, thank you for that offering. We receive the tithes because we do want to bless it. And we thank you, Father. We ask that you multiply it a thousandfold. Help each one of us, God, to see our responsibility to be tithers and givers. Let us not withhold nothing because you're so worthy. And so we're grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And amen. Turn in your Bibles to the gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 11. Mark, very familiar passage to all of us Palm Sunday groupies. Amen. Gospel according to Mark, looking at chapter 11, verse 1 through 11. Amen. This is our Lord last offering for March Gladness, worship that transforms. Close out that series, amen. The Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 11, verse 1 through 11. If you found it, say amen. Amen. If you still want me to wait, say wait, Pastor. Mark chapter 11. I'm reading out of the King James Version, and it reads thusly. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem, unto Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent forth two of his disciples, and said unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be, be entered into it, ye shall find a coat tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him, and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord have need of him, and straightway he will send him thither. And they went their way and found the coat tied by the door without, a, without in a place where two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do ye, loosing the coat? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off, off the trees and straw them in the way. And they that went before, and they that cried, followed, cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked around about upon all things, and now the evening time was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for the people of God. Blessed be the name of our God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to preach from the subject, worship involves praise, colon, you deserve it. Wonderful, I think it is the number one gospel song they're telling me right now. You deserve it. Everybody just say it out loud to the Lord, you deserve it. Worship involves praise, you deserve it. Pray with me and stay with me. Two processions entered Jerusalem on a spring day in the year 30. 
It was the beginning of the week of Passover, the most sacred week of the Jewish year. One was a peasant procession, and the other an imperial procession. From the east, Jesus rode a donkey down the Mount of Olives, cheered by his followers. Jesus was from the peasant village of Nazareth. His message was about the kingdom of God, and his followers came from the peasant class. On the other side of the city, from the west, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Odumea and Judea and Samaria, entered Jerusalem at the head of a column of imperial cavalry with soldiers that had chariots and stallions. Yet Jesus rode a colt attached to a foil, according to Matthew, uh, and his procession proclaimed the kingdom of God. Pilate proclaimed the power of empire. Pilate's military procession was a demonstration of both Roman imperial power and Roman imperial theology. Jesus' peasant procession was a demonstration of both uh, the power of the crucified life and the power of the kingdom of God captured in humility. It was Passover times and millions of pilgrims had pressed their way to gather to this great celebration. Nobody had the grand procession on their mind that Pilate was doing. Pilate's grand procession was not on their mind. Everyone was talking about the barefoot prophet who worked miracles and sought little or no attention. The Roman military was on high alert. Don't you know your praise will put the enemy on high alert? Your praise will cause the enemy to shudder. Your praise uh, directed to God draws concerns even from the pit of hell. All through the city, announcements and flyers were posted that Jesus was soon to come to the city. The grapevine and rumor mill was spilling out of control. Truth was trumping hearsay and social media was jumping. But the fact of the matter was Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Uh, he was no longer hiding in obscurity or uh, resisting to be seen and dodging stones from his enemies. Uh, the ultimate praise party was putting Jesus all the way out there. Pilate had horses and chariots shaking the earth in his procession, but they were drowned out by the earth's wobble from the worship <laughs> and the rumbling and pandemonium of praise because Jesus was coming. And it could be felt for miles and miles and miles. A royal carpet was prepared for Jesus using the coats of his admirers and his worshipers so that his royal feet would never touch the ground. Gardner Taylor, the dean of black preachers, bless his memory, says there ought to be a holy shout and a glad, sacred enthusiasm for the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody came here with a shout in your mouth this morning? Uh, anybody came with a praise? Because he deserves it. He deserves this. Uh, somewhere it says, Behold, I lay a Zion, uh, in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and that he believeth on him shall not be confounded. This is a clear and unmistakable reference to Christ Jesus who gives us reason for an enthusiasm of praise. I don't know about you, but I came to enthusiastically praise my God this morning. And so that thread of intense fervor and passion, uh, which uh, what enthusiasm really means, runs all through uh, the Lord Jesus' life. Uh, you recall when he had been baptized, Mark tells us that he was driven into the wilderness. And all his life he was driven by an intense consuming purpose which touched and filled every fiber of his being. Uh, he therefore deserves the passion of our praise and the wonder of our worship. Uh, have you noticed? Everywhere he went, he, he used the word, I must. Or uh, the word must. That's, that, that's one of Jesus' words. Uh, the multitude, if you recall, implored him to remain in Capernaum. But Jesus replied, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities. Uh, at the very beginning, that word had been on his lips. He said, I must be about my father's business. I'm trying to tell you, uh, he had intense passion, which pushed him to say, I must. Uh, when the threat of Herod was mentioned to Jesus, uh, he replied and shot back, 
I must walk today and tomorrow and the days following. And even when he saw Zacchaeus up in the tree in soul and body, Jesus called out today, I must abide at the house. As Jesus would later say uh, in his Via Dinarosa, the way of sorrow toward which he was being led, I hear the, lip, the must on his lips again. He says, as Moses is lifted up uh, as a serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Uh, we who are twice born, blood washed, redeemed, and purchased by his blood must praise him in this morning. Uh, we must praise him in the morning and praise him in the noonday hour and praise him all the night long. Because Jesus deserves our best praise. And the worshipers in Jerusalem were hollering at Jesus. Uh, they were losing their mind because Jesus, the miracle worker, Jesus, the deliverer, the healer, uh, the son of God, the king of kings, was now coming their way. Uh, and his movement was declaring he was coming out from hiding. He was coming out. Somebody say, come on out, Jesus. Ride on, King Jesus. Come on out, Jesus. And he made his way to the holy city. And for, so for, this, for this sermon, I, I, I want to give you some points to, uh, that will point to the praise uh, even point to the worship that included their praise because their praise that I believe in this text declares three things their praise and their worship declares three things one number one uh, it declares Christ's entry as a victorious king mm -hmm. it declares Christ's entry as a victorious king their worship involved in including their praise also number two declares in Christ's entry the kingdom of God had come and finally their praise declares at Christ's entry a crossroad for mankind these three things these three things I'm going to talk about them and get out of your way their worship involves praise and their praise declares one Christ's entry as a victorious king their praise declares in Christ's entry the kingdom of God had come and finally, their praise declares in Christ's entry a crossroad for mankind. It's all right there in the text. This procession down to Jerusalem and entry into one of those very public moments in Jesus' ministry was full of praise. It could be called his most brilliant act of political theater. Uh, you know that we have a number 45 in office right now that likes theater. Uh, and not only does he tweet, but he likes theater he likes to have all the attention uh, Jesus never tried to get attention in fact he told them over and over uh, go tell them nothing about himself uh, because he wanted to remain in secret but today uh, on Palm Sunday uh, it's his own declaration uh, that he's coming out from hiding uh, Jesus is proceeding toward Jerusalem with a crowd that undoubtedly some of the same sorts of outsiders that Jesus had been connecting with. Uh, it's just not anybody that who's given him praise, but they're sinners, the possessed, the sick, the blind, the women, the foreigners, uh, all those who were encountered by him. And it should be noted, the crowd that shouts Hosanna would have been laughed at by any sensible, uppity member of society who had who happened upon this odd ritual. They would be wondering, why are they making so, many, so much noise? Is this even necessary? Uh, have you ever been in church near somebody who wondered why you was praising God? Wondering why you were shouting? Why, wondering why you are running? Wondering why? Uh, some people will never understand your praise. Some people will never understand why you crying out, why you are uh, running down the aisle. Because they, they haven't been where you've been and haven't experienced what you experienced. And so, so don't look for people to understand your praise. Uh, many of them looking as if they were crazy. Uh, but much like I imagine today, those with a high sense of their own, own political value would little understand what compelled these odd folk to gather as they had, creating trouble because they were praising, uh, but creating trouble because at the same time, uh, the king on the other side, Pilate, was coming in to Jerusalem at the same time, which was a threat. And there are times you got to praise even when you're threatened. Uh, you, you got to lift God up even when there's a threat. You, and these are folks because they've been through too much to, to shut their mouth. They, uh, they refuse to shut their praise down. They're going to worship him because they've been through too much. So they were willing to go to jail cells and maybe even crosses. 
But this is Jesus, and this is why they have to do it. They, they have to praise God because this is not just anybody. This is Jesus. Uh, this is Jesus who healed the sick. This is Jesus who raised the dead, uh, forgave sinners, made the angry waves lie still at his feet. This is Jesus who changed uh, water into wine. Uh, Jesus who life made the Old Testament complete and who exposed the heart of God for all to see. Jesus who split the centuries in two with all before him backing up and all after him snapping to attention on the other side that he might stand as the completion of the old dispensation and inaugurate a new covenant. This is Jesus. This mind, uh, you know, is Jesus from whom devils ran pleading and crying. Lies made whole, uh, brought back to life and eternally changed by his touch. This is Jesus, I'm trying to tell you. This is Jesus. Uh, I don't know who you praise, uh, and I don't know why you came this morning, but if you didn't come to praise God, this is Jesus. This, this is the King of Kings, and uh, he ought to uh, get praise because he deserves it. The great writer Borge and Croson, both of these theologians came together and wrote a book called The Last Week. The book was about the last, the holy week that we're about to take that starts today. Uh, they talk and said that it makes the case that this peculiar celebration here on Palm Sunday in the text does not happen in isolation, but it is a rather a counter procession, mimicking a, a imperial procession entering the other side of Jerusalem at the same moment. Uh, so here we have Jesus followers celebrating their weakness by way of taking power from imperial forces that would seek to impung them. Uh, the grandeur of Pilate's procession was meant to highlight his superiority over the weak. So visualize it. Jesus is coming uh, from the east uh, on a donkey and, 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 and a Pilate is coming in with stallions and chariots from the other side. Two of them are actually happening. Uh, the grandeur of Pilate's procession was meant to highlight his superiority over the weak. Uh, he held the reins of a war horse to signify his mastery uh, of statecraft. But Jesus and his followers creatively reimagined their weakness as strength. I'm trying to tell you, uh, even in his weakness, uh, he's victorious. Uh, uh, even in his, humi his humility, he's victorious. Uh, they got uh, uh, stallions and chariots, but uh, he comes with a donkey, and Matthew says, attached to a foil. And so Jesus is basically riding a donkey that's nursing uh, at its weakest point. And, and they're riding stallions, and, uh, but yet in the midst of that, uh, we ought to praise him because his weakness and his humility is greater than all the stallions that Pilate can come into there. Uh, he's victorious. Uh, they don't deny their power and poverty. Uh, they're not trying to put on a show. They come in there uh, humble. Uh, Jesus has to be given a carpet made uh, by their coast. Jesus is riding on a donkey. Jesus does not deny his poverty or their poverty. Their very instruments of their celebration proclaims it publicly, but they deny the authority of the empire to define their reality for them and for him. Uh, see, see, he's coming there uh, victorious and he knows who he is and now publicly everybody knows who he is and he, what he's saying you can come through that gate with all your stallions but that's not going to shake my, my reality uh, I'm going to stand on the solid rock of Jesus this morning I'm not going to allow uh, what you do uh, you can raise up uh, the White House uh, you can investigate people uh, you can throw people out of the government but it ain't going to change the reality that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is King of Kings. The White House has to bow. The Senate has to bow. The Congress has to bow. The councils have to bow. The politicians have to bow. He is Lord. You see, Jesus enters as royalty and the victorious king of all kings. There, there. If you look at the text, they're celebrating their own hero. Rather than worshiping at the feet of political power. The same author, Croissant, wrote another book. He notes that in 332, 332 BCE, three centuries before Jesus, Palm Sunday entrance, Alexander the Great, having conquered Tyre and Gaza after terrible sieges, uh, Jerusalem had to open the gate 
without a fight. Alexander the Great came there and he took over Jerusalem. And we can imagine the victorious Alexander entering Jerusalem on his famous war, hall, war horse, known in history as the Black Stallion called Busphalius. This horse was unlike any horse. It was the largest black stallion ever. And Alexander came through Jerusalem high on a horse as a victorious king. But similarly, Croissant, the writer, highlights that the custom likely would have been for Pilate the same way. Pilate to make a similarly militaristic triumphal entry into Jerusalem with a war horse, chariots, and weapons. Each year in the days before Passover, he wanted to remind the pilgrims that Rome was in charge. And such a demonstration would have been especially pertinent at Passover since Passover was explicitly a celebration of the liberation of the Jews from slavery in Egypt. Hear me now. Uh, see, what I'm trying to say to you that the Jesus subversive donkey ride reminded all those who were waving palm branches that Rome was a new Egypt and the emperor was a new pharaoh. But there is a deliverer on the scene who's come in as king of kings. And not just any kind of king, but a victorious king. And so Jesus was saying, I come on a donkey. You come with stallions and weapons trying to elevate yourself. But I come to remind them. So when they were waving the palms, they were thinking of Passover. And they remember what happened to Egypt and what happened to Pharaoh when Moses the deliverer come to him. And so Jesus is coming in in a humble way saying, I am like Moses. I come to deliver deliver you so they were saying Hosanna which really means save us save us save us save us no okay I move on not only did the worship and praise declare Christ as a victorious king but it declared Christ's entry as a kingdom of God had come you know that in his birth uh, and his arrival, many people were saying the kingdom of God. And when he finally came uh, on the scene at 30 years old, before his even baptism, he was declaring the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is that right? And so, but you recognize Jesus' life, is, is, his beginnings are small. He, he was a little child in, in a little Bethlehem, in an obscure manage, a manger, and a, 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 a father, a carpenter uh, in Nazareth. And nothing good comes out of Nazareth. A uh, small band of disciples uh, uh, with one forerunner named John the Baptist. Everything about Jesus started off so tiny. Uh, and it might seem incredible that the humble ministry of this obscure Galilean could be the dawning of a new age of God. I'm going somewhere. Yet it is a new age of God. Uh, what has been begun here will surely go on to its conclusion. And listen, nothing can stop it. And the conclusion is victory. Mm -hmm. Everything about Jesus is about victory. His, his birth, his death, his resurrection is about victory. And not just victory for him, but victory for you. Yeah. So you should have the I can't help it. You, you, you should have I got to praise God. You mean to tell me all the hell I'm going through? Uh, I'm victorious. You mean uh, I don't have no money in my pocket and I, I'm victorious. You mean those people talking about me? I'm victorious. You mean uh, these ministries ain't cooperating with nothing? I'm victorious. You, you mean all the stuff I'm going through in the streets? You mean I, Yes! Yes! Because the kingdom has come. Uh, it lies at the very heart of the gospel message to affirm that the kingdom of God has in real sense become a, a, a residential fact here and now. And if you recall, the gospel of Mark opens in chapter 1 verse 15 reminds us that the future tense of the Old Testament. It says, behold, the days are coming and like has now become an emphatic, uh, emph emphatic present, uh, presentation. He says the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, it, 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 we've been thinking and talking about it all this time, and it's here. 
And so the final act of the drama has now uh, begun. The messianic age has dawned. He who is greater than Solomon, greater than Jonah, nay, greater than the temple, greater than the law, the servant on the scene and his works may be seen to all. No need anymore to look widely about for the signs of the kingdom's imminent coming. It's right here with you. And not only back in the text, but it's right here today, East Friendship, with you. You are a kingdom people uh, in the person and work of Jesus. Jesus, the kingdom intrudes into the world and that's what Palm Sunday is about it's an intrusion Jesus had been holding back all this time but now he's coming in so publicly and look at this he's coming in the face of the enemy he goes into Jerusalem that's an occupied territory and he ain't worrying about anybody killing him right there he's going in boldly uh, sometimes you gotta go boldly and despite what you feel despite how you're going through you gotta come boldly and the, and the Bible says he'll prepare a table in the presence of your enemies yes you got enemies yes I got enemies so what go boldly and praise God with boldness worship him with boldness lift your hands up with boldness the kingdom has come I know I'm dragging this sermon along I'm trying to drag you somewhere uh, just let me grab your collar a little bit let's go a little bit further because of perhaps the most notable thing whew, about Mark's version of this story is how anticlimactic it is mm-hmm it's anticlimactic. Despite all that hysteria, all that clamor, the, all the uproar surrounding Jesus, all the excitement of the parade, the outrageous worship occurring that has saturated with praise, uh, people chanting, crowds chanting, palms waving, the road strewn, strewn with coats and branches, it all leads well what appeared to be nothing. Because at the end of the text, Jesus says, goes back home to go to Bethany. He does all of that. And then turns around and quietly and go to Bethany. It looks about, appears to be about nothing. Jesus looks around and then turns around and returns to Bethany. Whatever the disciples expected to happen and whatever the crowds expected just did not happen. Their expectations and Jesus' agenda are two worlds apart. Their expectations and Jesus' agenda is two worlds apart. Their agenda is a coup d'etat. Mm -hmm. Jesus' agenda is to scope the place out to announce more publicly his kingship and his kingdom. He was going to prepare the atmosphere for his own murder. Mm -hmm. Their agenda is revolution that will sweep away one empire and replace it with a new empire. Jesus' agenda is a revolution that will replace empires altogether with a humanity in which everyone is included. And a kingdom that has no end. A kingdom that is in you. Yes, yes, yes. They celebrate a kingdom uh, that's on the outside. That has all the, 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 all the beauty and the glamour and the gold and the silver. But Jesus is coming to put a kingdom in you. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Their agenda is to co-op God to legitimate their vision of utopia. Jesus' agenda is to realize the divine image that lives in every person. So at the end of the day, after all the excitement, nothing happens. The expectations are utterly met. This indeed is the beginning of the end where the unmet false expectations turn the crowd adulation to disappointment and finally to a bloodthirsty anger. That's why Many people, not all, when it was time to be able to judge Jesus, they said crucify him. Uh, okay. They moved from Hosanna to crucifixion because their expectations is not met. Uh, uh, don't act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Because when, when, when God doesn't meet our expectations the way we want, we won't come to church. When, when God won't meet our expectations the way we want, we get bitter and angry. And when God doesn't do it the way we think he should do it, we get distant and we don't want to serve him. Uh, don't act like we don't know what they're talking about. They had expectations. They wanted God to take over. They wanted Jesus to take over the empire and put the oppressor down. But he did. But not the way they expected it. 
Uh, he did change things. The world changed and shifted on his access. Uh, he declared and decreed that day, I am king of kings, but I don't need no stallion and I don't need no weapons. Uh, I don't need no, no palace because I got a, I got one better than you can ever imagine because I go to prepare a place for you to so where I am, there you may be also. Uh, I don't need what man needs, but I got something better for you. I'm going to put something in you that's going to change your entire life i am uh, the kingdom of god and the kingdom of god represents me and so he don't need what we do uh, he's not like us and that's why uh, and he quietly turns around and say basically felt like what's all the fanfare about why did you put us through this? Some of them will say, why did you put us through this? But when you praise God, you praise him anyhow. You got to have an anyhow kind of worship, an anyhow kind of praise. You got to keep going in your praise no matter what. And sometimes you just walk away after you're all done, after you're all spent, after you gave God your best in worship. You just walk away and go back home, but you rest on your praise. Have you ever went home after church and you lay down and you find yourself speaking in tongues in your dreams? Because you're resting on your praise and you went home and you just resting on the goodness of God in the land of the living. Or you just resting on what God said in his word. You just resting. See, he don't have to have all that drama. He just said, okay, time to go home. His point was made. It was a serious political point to all the pharaohs of the world. Okay, all right, all right. Not, not, not only did their praise and worship declare Christ's entry as a victorious king, not only did they declare Christ's own entry as the kingdom of God has come, but finally, their worship and praise, uh, their, their power-packed praise declares a crossroad for mankind. Whew. Oh, y'all making me work today. For Christians, there is no real understanding of the joy of Easter without knowing the sorrow of Good Friday. The triumph of Palm Sunday has a cross purpose because there's no resurrection celebration without first facing the cross. So many of us want to avoid the cross. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. And we want to avoid it. Jesus Palm Sunday Parade has cross purposes. On the one hand, there's the crowd gathered for festive festivities, smiling and shouting, praise the Lord, clapping their hands and having a good old time. The crowd scene represents the joyous and even humorous side of the story and the joyous side of this day, the Palm Sunday side. It's the part where we've got all the regular folks enjoying the fun of the moment, thinking that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they can crown him to be king. And so they joined in the mood of the glory and joined in the mood of the hope and played along. Don't you know some people know how to play along? Yeah. Just to get along. Oh. Their praise is not really invested in God, but they're just playing along. My God. Lord, have mercy. And they joined the mood of glory and they played along, shouted Hosanna and waved their palms in the air like they just don't care. And they like, they pray, they reenacted the processional on this Sunday before, before Easter. But listen to them in the text. They said, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, he didn't just come in the name of the Lord. He was the Lord. For many years as a preacher, I've been captive to the insight that the fickle crowd who cried Hosanna as the, at the triumphal entry would have largely made up the crowd who cried for Jesus' crucifixion only days later, I used to hop on their fickleness. Uh, oh, I stood hold to that insight because I think they were fickle. It's just like church. Uh, we come for a congregation, but sometimes we only have a crowd. And so there's a difference between a congregation and a crowd. See, crowds don't really know why they're doing what they're doing. But a congregation ought to know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that's what John Jenkins was telling us in our pastoral uh, meeting the other day. He said, I, I got about 14 to uh, 16,000 and moving toward 20,000 people in here. He said, but I got about 3,000. That's the congregation and the rest of them are the crowd. Many come to take and very few, he says, gives. Mm, y'all ain't feeling that. That's all right. Fickleness. Fickleness. 
And so I've been very captivated by uh, the lockup sprung open by considering this word. Uh, there's a locking or critical uh, key that you got to put in the text to really unpack it. And it springs out. Uh, it's right in the etymology or the definition of Hosanna. Hosanna, they said. Reflecting on that one word, I'm beginning to realize that the culturally captive crowds of Jerusalem would have almost no other way of seeing the man uh, uh, on the hitherto unwritten cult than as the expected savior come to rescue them from their perceived enemies according to their perceived expectations. At the years of oppression, at the years of occupation, years of a po police state and police brutality, years of profiling, years of castrating our black man leaders, Years of, of treating our women like second class. Years of racism. Years of hate and thievery. Years of playing by somebody else's rules. Years of limitation. Years of control. Uh, can you blame them? They're saying, Hosanna, save us. The key lies, as I said, in the word Hosanna, which originally comes from Psalm 118.25. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. Or another way it says is, oh, Lord, we beseech, beseech you, give us success. You see, by the time Jesus, uh, by the time of Jesus, this psalm verse had found its way into common parlance as a greeting, as a blessing. Hosanna, they minimize the word as a blessing. Uh, but when one looks into the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, the word Hosanna in Psalm 118.25 is translated sunadai. Which, if you don't have Greek, means save us, but it's a save us of desperation. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, at, you at your last wit's end, and you're screaming because you need to be saved. It's like you on a cruise in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and somebody throws you off. Save us! You know if you were uh, thrown off the ship, you would act a fool. Blah, 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 blah. You, you would be screaming, save us, help me, help me. Come on, come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's, it's a different, because uh, uh, we always look at that Hosanna, blessed be the rock, and we all so happy. We don't realize what they're saying. Save us, we're desperate, save us. Because uh, they're recognizing him as king of kings. God, help us. Uh, you see, it's just like the old Irish people were in the middle of a conversation. They would say, just God help us. We say that sometimes in a nilly, willy, nilly way, uh, God help us. But there's an interesting sidelight here. See, if you go back and you look at John 12 and 27, uh, Jesus asking, he said, and what, what should I say? He said, Father, or Susan, Susan D, or say, he said, Susan D me from this hour. You see, in Gethsemane, Jesus uses the same word for Hosanna saying, save me from this hour. He's talking to the father there. Stay with me for a minute. Isn't that strange? The one thing Jesus said he wouldn't ask God of, save me from this hour, is the very thing that the crowd requires of Jesus in the Hosanna, save us now. Mm -hmm. See, maybe, just, maybe it's just me. But staying with the John passage, Jesus declines to ask God to save him. He rather switches and requests the Father to glorify his name. At face value, it would seem that the Jerusalem fan parade is glorifying God's name. But they really are not. They are simply demanding their own liberation. Have you ever been stuck in a box, uh, put in jail, uh, 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 just uh, between a rock and a hard place, and you need somebody to save you? Uh, it wasn't about their glory. It wasn't about Christ's glory at the moment. It was about their salvation. Uh, and, and, and all of us know what it is. I once was seeking, seeking deep in, a, uh, in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Uh, I didn't know how dark I was in and but jesus reached down and pulled me out and i didn't have to stay there no more i was blind and he opened my eyes uh, uh saved me he opened my opportunities he gave me new life they're desperate they're not trying to glorify god but now we who are redeemed who've been delivered and liberated we ought to have free open worship and praise we ought to have hilarious worship because we've been redeemed. We've been saved. We've been cleansed. Uh, we were 
nasty and, and dirty and he washed us clean through the shed blood. We was no good, but he always saw the good in us. Uh, we ought to liberate ourselves and say, save my family now. So when I say Hosanna, blessed be the rock, it's save my family, save my brother, save my sister, save our nation, save the White House, save the outhouse, save somebody today. Hosanna! The paradox of Jesus' life is that the glorification of God's name is found uh, in the humili humiliation of the accursed one who's nailed upon the tree. It's from there that the salvation called for Hosanna praises. Oh, that's that. I love that. See, they, they are, listen, this will get you in your spirit. They are praising in advance as if the cross happened. Sometimes you don't know how you're going to get out, but I'm going to praise him anyhow with an expectation. He's going to get me out. Uh, 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 salvation is now completely defined as the pouring out of his life in the cross, which brings me to the Der Jerusalem flash mob. And there, God help us. God save us. Jesus indeed does save. He liberates us. He gives sight to the blind. Jesus indeed saves. He sets the captives free. Uh, his life deserves praise. It brings all rules under his authority. And it points ever, everlasting to saving you and saving me. If you look at Jesus' life, all you can see is interest not in himself like Pontius Pilate, but interest in you and me. Uh, he was born contrary to the law of birth and he died triumphant over the law of death born into poverty yet wise men brought riches to the lowliness of his cradle born a helpless baby yet spoke spinning words into existence and sustains the mighty pillars of the universe by his own word he was cradled in another's crib sailed in another's boat rode somebody else's animal and was buried in somebody else's tomb. And yet, he belonged the, to the unsearchable riches of glory. He had no possessions except a garment for which they gambled when he died. Yet the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. When he was a boy, he confused the scholars. And when he was a man, he made the angry storm hush up. He healed all manner of disease and charged not a penny for his service. He wrote no book, but the libraries cannot hold the books written in his name. Ha. Composed no music, but the noblest genius of melody lay their talent at his feet. Herod could not kill him. Satan could not seduce him. Sin could not stand him. Roaring seas could not swallow him. Sinners could not resist him. Death could not destroy him. And the grave could not hold him down. He is the rose of Sharon for those who know uh, need the need love. The captain of Jehovah's host for all those who are besieged. The bright and morning star for all those that are in darkness. The great high priest bearing our sin offering on himself. Do you know why he deserves your praise? All I can say, Jesus, you deserve it. You deserve my praise. You deserve my unlimited worship. You deserve my best. You deserve my all. You deserve my gifts. You deserve my tithes. You deserve my loyalty. You deserve my praise. Uh, Jesus, uh, you deserve it. You deserve my all. Uh, you deserve my very life. Uh, Abraham said, I gave my life and he made me fathers of nations. Joseph said, I gave him my life, and he made me the preserver of my people. Moses said, I gave him my life, and he made me the liberator of Israel. David said, I gave him my life, and he made me the sovereign of Israel. Solomon said, he gave me my life, and he made me the man of wisdom. Nehemiah said, I, he gave me my life, and he made me the rebuilder of the walls. I'm trying to let you know, you ought to give him your life, because he deserves it.
He deserves your worship. He deserves your sacrifice of praise. And he deserves it. Come on. You deserve it, God. You deserve everything I got. You deserve my hands in the air. You deserve the shout of my feet. You deserve that I open my mouth to praise her. You came down 40 in two generations. You deserve it. Remove the royal diadem. You deserve it. Took on the body of flesh. You deserve it. Walked the earth 33 years. You deserve it. Healed the sick and raised the dead. You deserve it. Healed by Bartimaeus. You deserve it. Healed the woman at the well. You deserve it. Delivered them from demons. You deserve it. Went to the cross with all power uh, coming to your hands. You died on Calvary and you deserve everything I got. I, I know why they were screaming. I know why they were praising. You deserve it. Anybody here believes? You deserve it. Come on. Get to your feet and just say, You deserve my best. You deserve my best praise you deserve everything i got take it you deserve it you deserve it you deserve it you deserve it god father you deserve it Whew. forgive me god for withholding my praise when i'm going through my own stuff Forgive us all, God, for forgetting to worship you. You deserve our best. You've done so much and you're still doing so much. You deserve our sacrifice of praise. You deserve us to authentically worship you, God. Oh, God. We are straining at gnats and refusing to praise you because we're hiding our lights under a bushel. On this Palm Sunday, where a lot of people was throwing their coats down, crying that they would be saved. But many of them never got a chance to confess Christ. But we are the redeemed now. You saved me and you saved the many under the sound of my voice. I believe you deserve everything, God. And we're just going to give you this praise offering right now. Come on, stand to your feet and begin to praise him. In the mighty name of Jesus.